One of my favorite things to read in the teachings of Yeshua is when he describes what the kingdom of heaven is like. Many, many times Yeshua describes the kingdom of God. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. The kingdom of heaven is like mustard seed. Many descriptions like this. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, like a, a merchant seeking fine pearls. The kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet. All of these descriptions of the kingdom of heaven. Yeshua used everyday language and examples to describe in parables eternal spiritual truths about the kingdom of God. And that's what I want to try to do tonight. Now, I'm not, you know, like Yeshua. I'm trying to be like Yeshua, but he's way beyond me. But I'm going to try to kind of tell a parable tonight from the book of Deuteronomy as we take a look at what I'm calling this message a parable of two lands or a tale of two lands. So let's look in Deuteronomy chapter 11 as we continue in this series, Dunamis from Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 11 beginning in verse 8, 8 to 14. Therefore, you shall keep every commandment which I command you today, that you may be strong and go in and possess the land which you uh, cross over to possess, and that you may prolong your days in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to them and their descendants, a land flowing with milk and honey. For the land which you go to possess is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come, where you sowed your seed and watered it by foot as a vegetable garden. But the land which you cross over to possess is a land of hills and valleys which drink water from the rain of heaven, a land for which the Lord your God cares. The eyes of the Lord your God are always on it from the beginning of the year to the very end of the year. And it shall be that if you earnestly obey my commandments, which I command you today, to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart, with all your soul, then I will give you the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the latter rain, that you may gather in your grain your new wine and your oil. What an amazing portion of scripture. And what an amazing parable of two lands. Two lands are presented here. In verse 10, for the land you're going to possess, that's one of the lands, the land you're going to possess is not like the other land, the land of Egypt, from which you have come where you sowed... Um, your seed and watered it by foot as a vegetable garden, but the land which you cross over to possess is a land of hills and valleys, which drinks water from the rain of heaven. The one land is the land of Egypt, and the other land is the land which you go to possess, the promised land. Here we are told that this new land is not like Egypt. It's different. You know, when I uh, moved up here to Canada many years ago, actually 25 years ago, moving up here as a typical American, and I don't say that to put me down or put Americans down, but a typical American says, oh, Canada, you know, U.S., same thing. So I... I Please apologize me. I'm apologizing for my ignorance about Canada at that time. But to me, well, Canada, U.S., one and the same. So that's what I thought until I moved here and realized, you know what? This is a different land. This
this is really a different country. There's a whole different political system here. There's a whole different health care system here. There's a whole different mindset here. And there's a whole different accent, eh, here. I mean, it's different. Canada is different than the U.S., not to the extent that this new land God is speaking about is different from Egypt, but nevertheless, it is different. Now, much of Egypt is flat. And in Egypt, it hardly ever rains. It's very dry. For agriculture, they depended on the overflow of the Nile River to water the land. But that was not enough to reach all the areas that needed to be watered. And I want to read an excerpt from a commenter on this verse explaining what it means to water with the foot. Not like the land of Egypt where you watered with the foot. He says, in order to water the grounds where the inundations or the overflow do not extend, Water is collected in ponds and directed in streamlets to the different parts of the field where irrigation is necessary. It is no unusual thing in the East to see a man with a small, kind of like a pickaxe, making a little trench for the water to run into. And as he opens the passage, the water following, he uses his foot to raise up a mound against the side of this little channel to prevent the water from being shed unnecessarily before it reaches the place of its destination. Hence, he may justly be said to water the ground with his foot. So besides all the laboring of preparing for crops, the normal laboring, It required a tremendous amount of work to get water into the field, pickaxing long, you know, things, putting your foot up so that the water doesn't overflow the sides. It was a laborious, painstaking process. But what a contrast when we read verse 11. But the land which you cross over to possess is a land of hills and valleys, not just flat. And it drinks water from the rain of heaven. That is a lot different and a lot better than watering it with the foot. That's an amazing contrast. And not only that, look in verse 12. This land... It's a land for which the Lord your God cares. Now that word cares is the word in Hebrew, doresh. We do a drash. We inquire of the word, an inquiring, an asking about. The Lord is is caring and asking for it, seeking its well-being. A land for which the Lord your God cares. The eyes of the Lord your God are always on it. From the beginning of the year to the very end of the year. You know, if you're going to be involved in agriculture, that's a pretty good land to be involved in. A land for which the Lord your God cares. His eyes are on it from the beginning of the year to the end. An amazing contrast with the harsh, arid, difficult land of Egypt. But do you see the spiritual picture here? I I, I received a a whole picture that I'm going to try to relate here about this tale of two lands, this parable of two lands. The land which you go to possess. Now, obviously, it's speaking about a physical land. Of course, Deuteronomy, Moses preparing Israel to go into the physical land. And there's a primary application here to a physical land in a physical place. But the spiritual picture, the land which you go to possess, is a picture of the spiritual kingdom of God. It is not like 
the land of Egypt, which is a picture of the world. Okay? That is the spiritual teaching here. In Egypt, they were accustomed to self-effort. That's what working it with the foot, the arduous self-effort of producing fruit in an arid and a dry land. Watering by the foot to bring forth fruit. The kingdom of God, on the other hand, operates in a whole different way. It operates by grace provided from heaven. Those rains are a grace gift of God from heaven. Freely given by a God of love who constantly cares for and is watching over his spiritual kingdom. Amen? Do you see the picture? Egypt, the world, you have to labor with intensity. The kingdom of God operates by the grace of a loving God. That's the picture. And so we have here a picture, and I'm going to move over here now. We have a picture or a parable of two lands, two kingdoms. And I want to depict this. Two systems of righteousness, if you will. And one is Egypt. The other is the promised land. Two lands, two systems, two realities. Okay, that's the picture here. And so Egypt speaks of self-effort. A system of self-effort where you're laboring, making the furrows with, with the foot, laboring with the foot. And the promised land is grace from heaven. The rains from heaven. Two lands, two systems, two different worlds. Now, I want to say about this, and it's important especially for young people. I know they're in there. Hopefully they'll be here tomorrow when I share this message. All religious systems, I'm going to write that, all religious systems, systems in the world except this system operates this way. And what do I mean? I mean that every religious system apart from faith in Messiah operates this way. We need to do right in order to become, to be right. Okay? We need to do right in order to become right. Those are the systems of religion in the world. This system is totally different. This system does not rest on the footwork in the land, but faith in Messiah. In other words, grace from heaven provided the Messiah. And the way that this works is the exact opposite of how this works. This works by saying, by faith in Messiah, I'm being right. Then I can do right. It's the exact opposite. This says, I've got to do the right thing 
in order to become right. This system says in Messiah, he is the perfect one. And in him, you are made right instantaneously. And as a result of that, now with a new heart, you can do the right things. And it matters. Radically different kingdoms. The one says, if only I do enough, then I can become. The other says, I'm made right in Messiah, therefore I can do right. Now let me give an example here. I know I'm not hitting a lot of scriptures. We're going to look at scriptures now. But I wanted to try to explain what came into my heart as I read about this two lands. Let's say two different people, okay? Two people, let's Joe and John. This is Joe, this is John. Who's this? And? All right. Joe and John want to do the right thing. The problem is they both have a mountain of credit card debt. You ever have a mountain of credit? I, I did at one point. Not fun. Had a mountain, and you know, Joe basically, you know, all right, I, I know I have it, and it just keeps mounting up and either f tries to forget about it or defers it or whatever. And then he's trying to do right, but in the end, what inevitably happens when you have insurmountable credit card debt. The day comes, the day of reckoning comes, right? At some point, it crashes, okay? And so he can be on the outside looking like he's doing the right thing, but in the end, it crashes because he hasn't dealt with that credit card debt. John, on the other hand, comes and says, you know what? I can do a lot of good things, but unless I get rid of this debt, it's all going to be for naught. And he comes, and instantaneously, his debt is forgiven. It's wiped out. It's gone. And now, out of that, he can begin to do good things, and it mounts up, and it counts for good, for the long haul. Do you see what, you see what I'm saying? This example. Now, of course, we're not dealing with a mountain of credit card debt. That mountain is a mountain of sin. It's a mountain of sin. You could say that you want to do the right thing, but when you come with a mountain of sin, even if you try to forget about it, sooner or later, it's going to crush you. And you can't do the right thing because of the mountain of sin. You'll never do enough right to get rid of that sin. This system says you'll never be good enough. But Messiah has come. He's the perfect Messiah. His blood has been shed. Receive instantaneous forgiveness of your sins. And then run the race without the burden of the sin. Two different systems. Two different kingdoms. I want to take a look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, and let's look at what the scriptures say about this. Ephesians chapter 2, these are familiar verses. Uh, verse 8, Ephesians 2 verse 8. This is the scriptural, that was my attempt at giving the parabolic interpretation. Here's the scriptural teaching of it. Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of itself, not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, 
not by the foot, not by you working the land with your feet, not by works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Messiah Yeshua for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. By grace, the rains from heaven, it rained down, the Messiah has come. Grace from heaven has appeared and brought forgiveness of our sins. By grace, we're saved. We're made right so that we can do right. That's the biblical system that the Messiah brings. By grace are we saved through faith and that not of ourselves. It is a gift from heaven. Gift. We're made right so that we can do right without being encumbered by a mountain of sin. Another verse we're familiar with, 2 Corinthians. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Again, this idea of being made right instantaneously. Therefore, if anyone is in Messiah... If you have received the gift of salvation in Messiah, if you are in Messiah, he is a new creation. In other words, immediately his identity has changed. It's identity-based, not deed-based. It starts with identity. You're a new creation. You're instantaneously cleansed and forgiven, and you have a new identity. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's what we're talking about. The new land is not like the old land. The new land is not like Egypt. The new land in Deuteronomy becomes the new life in the kingdom of God. A new identity in Messiah. A new man. Recently, I've been reading the book... I'm actually on my second reading of this book uh, called Atomic Habits. I mentioned it before. And the author, who I'm not sure is a believer, had a, you know, the whole book is about how a structure for establishing new habits and breaking old habits. Um, And 95% of the book is, you know, biblically okay. There's a small percent that's a little off, but... But the book is good enough. Now, the thing that he does is, let me see if I can explain this, because it's not in my notes, but I wanted to share about it. He says most people try to establish new habits by setting a goal, establishing some kind of a system to change, and then changing their identity. So, outcome. I want to... Um, I want to start working out. That's the outcome. Okay, here's my system. I'm going to work out. I'm going to go to the gym three days a week. That's the system. And then the identity would be, I'm going to become a healthy person. But what he says, the better way to do it is reversing the order of saying, why do I want to do work out? Because I want to be a healthy person. He starts with identity, then goes to the system, and then the outcome. Very, very insightful. And that's exactly God's system. He starts with our identity. You'll never be in good enough shape. Start with a new identity that I give you. Amen? That's the whole thing here. That's the kingdom. So we enter this new land in the kingdom, this new life, this new identity by faith in what Yeshua has provided. He has given it to us as a gift. But we must continue in the kingdom the way we began. The just shall live by faith 
in this kingdom. We don't just make a start by faith. We live by faith in this new land. We receive the Holy Spirit by faith. Look in Galatians chapter 3, verse 2. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? How did you receive the Holy Spirit? By faith. Gift of God, I receive it by faith. And not only that, God works miracles the same way. Verse 5, Therefore he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? So God works miracles. And the only way to live this new life in Messiah, in the kingdom, is by faith. Faith. And so your faith must grow. Now, two weeks ago, I spoke at our Motse Shabbat group. A number of Russian-speaking people, many of which are believers. And I spoke about growing in faith. And I shared three things that they can do to grow in their faith. And I want to finish this message by sharing with you, some of you again, those three simple things, how to continue to grow in faith in the kingdom of God. Three things. We get into this kingdom by faith. We grow three ways. Number one, you must Feed your faith. You must feed your faith. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Can't be passive in the kingdom. 1 Timothy 4 verse 6. If you instruct the brothers in these things, you will be a good minister of Yeshua the Messiah. Nourished in the words of faith. Nourished in the words of faith. Can we say that together? Nourished in the words of faith. That is feeding your faith. If you're going to be someone who's healthy, you need nutrition. Nutrition is key to a good physical health. Spiritual nutrition. You must be nourished on the words of faith. These are the words of faith. And just like you feed yourself food every day, so you must feed your faith every day. Read the Bible systematically. Get a Bible reading plan. There's one on our website, cityofdavid.com. There's a Bible reading plan on that website. There's one in the bookstore as well. And as you read, ask questions. I want to recommend a book if you haven't read it yet, or maybe you've read it and you tried this. And you, it, it, It's a great book called The Divine Mentor by Wayne Cordero. How many have read this book? How many are using this in your devotions, the system? Okay. Now, you don't have to, but it's a great system. And the reason I like it is because it's simple, and it puts devotional Bible study into a certain structure to help you to feed yourself spiritually. I'm recently working with, a, with someone in discipleship, and I recommended that they read this book, and they started doing this soap where you S scripture, observation, application, prayer. And this person said to me, using this method of, t of notes after you read is so much more effective in reading the Bible than just reading the Bible. Much more effective because you're asking questions 
when you read. So if you do not eat, you will be weak. If you do not feed your faith, your faith will be weak. Number one, feed your faith. Number two, you need to exercise. If you're going to be healthy physically, you need to exercise. Whether it's push-ups, running, whatever, exercise your faith in prayer. We feed our faith in the Word of God, but prayer is the, the realm in which we exercise our faith and build our faith muscles. If you'll put up Yehuda, Judah, verse 20. But you, beloved, continue building yourselves up on your most holy faith. How? How do you build yourself up? Praying in the Holy Spirit. Praying in the Ruach HaKodesh. You are praying. You're exercising your faith muscles in prayer, and you strengthen your faith through prayer in this way. So not only will the Holy Spirit help you to understand the Bible, but he will help you in your prayer. And of course, I strongly recommend that you have a prayer list, a physical prayer list. could be on your phone or a list, rather than just praying out of your head. Stop doing that. Stop only praying out of your head. Have a list. A list that would include Rabbi Jeff. Top on that list. That guy needs your prayer, I'll tell you right now. Family members. Friends at the synagogue who you're aware of. Your friends, your neighbors. The nation of Israel. Canada should be on that list. Pray for your own needs, your job, your relationship with God, the projects you're involved in, but not only your projects. Bear one another's burdens in prayer. Okay? So we build ourselves up on our most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. We get into the kingdom by faith, but we must grow in faith by feeding our faith. By, on the word of God, strengthening our faith by exercising in prayer. And thirdly, using our faith. In order to grow spiritually, we must act on our faith. Yeshua said, freely you've received, now freely give. We grow by using our faith. In Hebrews it says, those who by reason of use have their senses trained. They're using it, they're honing it, and they're growing in it. And I want to give you one simple way to use your faith every day. Every day you need to feed your faith. Every day you need to exercise your faith. Every day you can ask a question. Who can I bless today? Who needs prayer? Who needs a call? Who needs a visit? Who needs some help? How can I serve? How can I help? How can I use my faith? Lord, I'm available. I want you to use me. And I want to use my faith in the world around me. In the people around me. So it's not just me feeding my faith and me building my faith. I am now a vessel that God can use in using my faith to bless other people. Amen? So in Deuteronomy, we see the picture of two lands, really two kingdoms, if you will. Two lands representing two kingdoms. One is the kingdom of self-effort. Now, you may have gotten into the kingdom by faith, but you have slipped into a standard of your own righteousness. You've slipped back into self-effort. 
And I pray the Lord would help each one of us to make sure that we're living by faith in the rains from heaven. The kingdom of self-effort is Egypt. We try to become by doing. It fails. The other kingdom is the kingdom of grace where by faith we become afresh and anew. And then we act. We receive cleansing, forgiveness, and new life by faith in Yeshua. We continue to grow in our faith by being nourished on the words of faith. We continue to exercise our faith in the prayer realm. And we continue to use our faith every day in the world around us. God responds to such by sending showers of blessing from heaven. This is the parable of two lands. Which land are you in? Lord, I want to thank you. I want to praise you for this little parable, this picture of two lands that we've read about tonight. That this new land is not like the land that we came from. This new land drinks water from the rains of heaven. And we thank you for such a picture of the kingdom of God. We give you glory and we give you praise for this in Yeshua's name.